Welcome to part 39 of the Ultimate Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg, where we explore true crime, urban legends, mysterious disappearances, myths and legends, internet mysteries, and more. Also, quick note, I'm back from a brief hiatus after my vehicle was stolen. I'll say this for the few who will get the reference. Insurance companies, not even once. The Bunny Man. The Bunny Man is an urban legend primarily stemming from incidents reported in Fairfax County, Virginia. This figure is often depicted as wearing a bunny costume and involved in unsavory activities. The first reported sighting occurred in 1970, when a couple encountered a man dressed in a rabbit costume who vehemently protested their presence, claiming they were trespassing. This individual reportedly threw a hatchet through the couple's car window, which was later recovered by the police. The actual hatchet involved in the original Bunny Man incident is still preserved and on display. A similar incident was reported two weeks later, involving another couple in the same area. The mysterious figure again appeared in a rabbit costume and purportedly attacked their parked car with an axe. Despite numerous police investigations, no one was ever apprehended, and the case remained unsolved. This lack of closure fueled local folklore, eventually giving rise to the broader Bunny Man legend. These initial incidents were documented in local newspapers, and as the story spread, it morphed into a broader and more sinister narrative. The urban legend gained national traction when the Washington Post began to report on the unusual occurrences. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Washington Post, it's a paper that is local to the area where the Bunny Man incident occurred. However, the Washington Post also has significant national and international reach, likely only behind the New York Times for American newspapers. Subsequent Bunny Man stories varied significantly, with some mentioning the Bunny Man wielding an ax and being generally intimidating, while others described more overtly threatening behavior. Central to the Bunny Man legend is the setting of Clifton, Virginia, and particularly a structure known as the Bunny Man Bridge. This bridge, an overpass located on Colchester Road, became linked to the story due to its eerie and isolated ambiance. Urban legends suggest that the Bunny Man lurks around this area, especially during Halloween. Several theories have been proposed regarding the origins of the Bunny Man. Some suggest that the story might be a conflation of different historical events or misreported incidents. Others believe it may be rooted in the area's history of mental institutions and their historical stigmatization, with the Bunny Man serving as a manifestation of societal fears surrounding mental illness. Another theory posits that the story could be an exaggerated response to a real person's unusual behavior, possibly exacerbated by the local rumor mill. Another theory posits that the Bunny Man is actually a time-traveling juggalo furry hybrid. Supporters of this theory cite the Bunny Man's well-documented use of a hatchet, as well as his use of a fur suit. And you may be asking at this point, who put this theory forward? Well, spoiler alert, this one is a Lazy Chill Zone original. Let me know your own original Bunny Man theory in the comments below. The Disappearance of Henry Hudson Henry Hudson was an extremely prominent English navigator and explorer in the early 17th century. His disappearance in 1611 during an ill-fated expedition to discover the Northwest Passage remains one of maritime history's foremost mysteries. Henry Hudson was a seasoned navigator known for his determination and expertise in icy waters. By 1611, Hudson had already embarked on several voyages, aiming to find a northerly route to Asia. His final voyage began auspiciously as he commanded the discovery setting sail with a crew that included his son. The journey was fraught with challenges from the start. Hudson's ship became trapped in the ice near present-day Hudson Bay, a vast body of water in Canada that would later bear his name. 
As the winter of 1610 to 1611 set in, food supplies dwindled and morale plummeted. The situation within the discovery deteriorated rapidly, setting the stage for mutiny. The known facts about Hudson's fate end in June 1611. It was then that tensions culminated in a mutiny led by several crew members. Hudson, his son, and a few loyalists were cast adrift in a small, open boat. What followed remains a matter of conjecture, as no definitive records of their fate exist. Following the mutiny, the mutineers made a harrowing journey back to England, where they faced trial. And as a quick aside, most of the mutineers passed away prior to their arrival back in England. Interestingly, most were acquitted, and the detailed circumstances of the mutiny were never fully disclosed. Theories about what happened to Hudson after being set adrift vary widely. One prevalent theory suggests that Hudson and his companions might have tried to survive on the shores of Hudson Bay. Some indigenous oral histories hint at the presence of European men matching their description in the years following the mutiny. These accounts suggest a possible integration into a local tribe or a failed attempt to live off the harsh land. Another theory speculates that Hudson attempted to sail back to Europe or find a populated outpost in North America. This theory is bolstered by occasional European artifacts found in archaeological digs near Hudson Bay, which some suggest could have been left by Hudson or his crew. Perhaps most fascinating was a find in the late 1950s in the town of Deep River, Ontario. An engraving was found on a large rock with the date 1612, the initials HH, and the word captive. Notably, the lettering on the stone was found to be of the style used by English navigators on their maps in the 17th century. This has led to the theory that Hudson and perhaps his son were being held captive by either a native tribe or perhaps even French colonists. Further adding to the mystery are the stories and legends that sprang up in the aftermath of Hudson's disappearance. Some narratives romanticize his end as a quest for survival against all odds, battling the elements in a harsh, unforgiving landscape. Others focus on the tragic aspect of his story, portraying him as a victim of betrayal by his own crew. Theories aside, the disappearance of Henry Hudson highlights the perilous nature of early exploration, especially in the icy waters of the Arctic. However, not all is negative, and Hudson left an extremely significant legacy, despite his uncertain end. Hudson's expeditions, particularly his last, contributed significantly to the mapping of the northeastern coast of North America and opened up new routes for future explorers. If you're enjoying my content, please hit the like and subscribe buttons and the notification bell. Also, I release content very regularly, so I can't emphasize this enough. Ring the bell and turn on all notifications so you're never behind on this series. Also, if you really want to take it to the next level, please consider signing up for a YouTube membership or a Patreon membership. You can support for as little as 99 cents a month. Remember to join the Discord as well if that's your thing. We've got nearly 100 members at this point. Spontaneous Human Combustion Spontaneous human combustion is a phenomenon that has both mystified and intrigued observers for centuries. This phenomenon involves cases where a human body purportedly catches fire and is consumed by flames without an apparent external source of ignition. The history of spontaneous human combustion dates back to the 17th century, with numerous cases reported through the 1800s, which continue to be documented today. Scientifically, spontaneous human combustion is considered a pseudoscientific concept as no conclusive evidence supports the spontaneous ignition of a human body without an external flame source. Historical accounts often describe the victims being almost completely incinerated while their surroundings suffer minimal damage. 
For instance, an individual is commonly described as incinerated while their chair remains untouched. These cases commonly feature elderly, isolated individuals who are often found with their extremities intact while the torso is completely burned. One of the earliest and most famous literary references to spontaneous human combustion is in Charles Dickens's novel, Blank House. In this novel, a character meets his end through a spontaneous human combustion event. Dickens's inclusion of spontaneous human combustion in his novel reflects the fascination and widespread discussion of the topic during the Victorian era. Throughout the centuries, various theories have been proposed to explain spontaneous human combustion. These range from the body's alcohol content acting as an accelerant to supernatural explanations such as divine intervention. However, modern scientific investigations claim to have, quote, debunked these earlier theories. They suggest that external sources of ignition and the wick effect, where the body acts like an inside-out candle with clothing or other nearby flammable materials feeding the fire, are more plausible explanations. Noteworthy cases include that of Countess Cornelia de Bandy in 1731, whose demise was so peculiar that it prompted extensive debate among contemporaries about the possible causes of the blaze. Notably, my brief review of her specific case indicates that she may have spilled alcohol on her clothing, which suggests an alternative cause of this combustion. More modern examples include the 1951 case of Mary Reeser, whose body was found almost entirely reduced to ashes in her otherwise relatively undamaged apartment. However, subsequent investigations into the Reeser case have suggested that she was a significantly overweight heavy smoker wearing flammable clothing. Under this theory, she may have dropped ash onto her clothing, which caused the initial fire, with her chair and body fat serving as subsequent fuel. Further, her apartment was bare bones and the floor was concrete, suggesting why there was no further damage. At any rate, spontaneous human combustion remains a well-documented mystery, much like other scientific mysteries such as ball lightning. The Salyut Seven Angels This is a recommendation from Patreon supporter Iced Mocha, with assistance from her with Russian language sources. Notably, this story has received almost no coverage in English language sources. The Salyut Seven Space Station, launched by the Soviet Union on April 19, 1982, was the site of one of the most mysterious episodes in the history of space exploration. Salyut 7 served as a key platform for scientific research and was operational until 1991. It was equipped with advanced facilities, including two docking ports and an array of solar panels, making it the most comfortable and advanced of the Salyut stations at that time. Dubbed the Salyut 7 Angels Incident, it involves reports from cosmonauts aboard the station who claim to have witnessed celestial beings during their mission. The bizarre sightings occurred twice during the mission in July 1984. Initially reported by cosmonauts Leonid Kizim, Vladimir Solovyov, and Oleg Atkov, they described encountering an intense orange light that seemed to penetrate the station. This was followed by the appearance of large humanoid figures with wings, resembling traditional depictions of angels. These figures were reported to be visible outside the station, accompanying it briefly before disappearing. Just days after the initial encounter, the phenomenon reportedly recurred, this time observed by an expanded crew that included additional members from the Soyuz T-12 mission both times, the cosmonauts described these beings as peaceful, with a serene demeanor, each encounter lasting several minutes before the figures vanished. The explanations for these sightings vary widely. Some experts suggest they could have been hallucinations induced by the extended duration in space and the high stress of orbital operations, especially considering the psychological and physical strain on space travelers. Others speculate that the event was, in essence, a mass hysteria or a shared delusion in space. 
Others speculate more extraordinary explanations, ranging from divine manifestations to encounters with extraterrestrial entities. However, no definitive evidence has been presented to confirm any of these theories. In the context of Cold War secrecy and the sensational nature of the claims, the Soviet Space Agency was reportedly quick to classify the details of the incident. It wasn't until the decline of the Soviet Union that these accounts became widely known in former Eastern Bloc countries, contributing to ongoing debates and speculations about what the cosmonauts really saw. These stories resonate not just in the history of space exploration, but also in popular culture, where they fuel theories about human encounters with otherworldly beings. Despite extensive investigations and discussions, the Salyut Seven Angels incident remains a complete mystery at present. The Girl from the Lem Statue The Girl from the Lem, also known as the Woman from Lem, is a statue that has captivated the public due to the dark lore surrounding it. This artifact, carved from pure limestone, was unearthed in Lem, Cyprus in 1878 and its creation dates back to around 3500 BC. While its precise function is not definitively known, it is thought to have possibly served as a fertility statue to an as yet to be identified goddess. Despite its benign possible purpose as a fertility enhancer, the statue is better known for its alleged lethal impact on its owners. The history of the statue includes a series of owners who reportedly met untimely ends. The first recorded owner, Lord Elfont, saw his entire family perish within six years of acquiring the statue. Subsequent owners, Ivor Minucci and Lord Thompson Noel, along with their families, faced similar fates within a few years of possessing the statue. The eerie pattern of fatalities linked to the statue led to it acquiring a number of sinister nicknames and enhancing its dark reputation. In an attempt to end this cycle, the last private owner, Sir Alan Beaverbrook, whose family also suffered under the statue's ownership, donated it to the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh. Interestingly, the museum curator who initially handled the statue reportedly died within a year adding another layer of intrigue and fear surrounding the artifact. Today, the statue remains in the museum, securely placed behind glass, perhaps as much to protect it from the world as to protect the world from it. Theories about the statue's supposed curse vary widely. Some speculate that the statue may be imbued with ancient energies or curses linked to the goddess it possibly represents, Others suggest that the series of unfortunate events associated with its owners might be coincidental or influenced by psychological factors. Under this theory, the belief in the curse brings about a heightened perception of normal life events as sinister and foreboding, leading to disastrous outcomes. Others question the story as a whole, noting that while the statue itself is definitely real, the stories surrounding the so-called curse are poorly attested. In my view, this case has a lot of similarities to the much more well-known Hope Diamond curse covered in a previous entry in the series. Also like the Hope Diamond curse, upon basic research, there appears to be virtually no supporting evidence for the claims associated with the curse. I feel fairly comfortable categorizing this mystery under the same heading as creepy stories from Reddit, complete fiction. The Northeast Blackout of 1965. On November 9, 1965, at approximately 5.15 p.m., a significant portion of the northeastern United States and parts of Canada were plunged into darkness. This affected over 30 million people in an area spanning 80,000 square miles. This event, known as the Northeast Blackout of 1965, stands as one of the most significant power failures in North American history. The blackout began with a small human error. A misconfigured relay at the Sir Adam Beck station on the Ontario side of the Niagara River. Yeah, you heard me right. 
Under the official narrative, you can blame Canada for this one. This seemingly minor issue at a single power station led to a series of failures throughout a power grid that was heavily interconnected and reliant on each station maintaining its load. As demand peaked during the early evening hours, the error caused a transmission line from the Niagara generating station to trip, setting off a domino effect. Within seconds, power stations across Ontario and the northeastern United States were overwhelmed, leading to widespread outages. The immediate effects were dramatic and far-reaching. In New York City, over 800,000 people were trapped in the subway system, while thousands more were stuck in elevators across the affected areas. Airports were shut down, and in the era before widespread cellular communication, the lack of information led to confusion and anxiety. Despite the widespread disruption, the response to the blackout was notably calm and orderly. In New York City, for example, citizens directed traffic and helped emergency services. The event was marked by a spontaneous spirit of cooperation that prevented any major crises during the hours without power. This reaction was later highlighted as a testament to the resilience and community spirit of the affected populations. One of the most fascinating aspects of the 1965 blackout was the range of theories and mysteries that emerged regarding its cause. While the blackout is now officially considered solved, there are still numerous conspiracy theories surrounding the blackout. During the Cold War era, the idea that sabotage could be a cause was taken seriously. The FBI investigated the possibility that the blackout could have been deliberately caused as an act of espionage or sabotage by foreign agents. Others speculated that geomagnetic storms caused by solar flares might have interfered with the Earth's magnetic field, inducing currents that tripped the power lines and equipment. At the more extreme end of the spectrum, there were claims linking the blackout to unidentified flying objects. These stories were fueled by concurrent sightings of strange lights in the sky, which were later attributed to increased public awareness and vigilance in the dark starlit skies of the blackout affected area. Subsequent investigations by the Federal Power Commission pointed squarely to the relay setting error and the vulnerabilities in the power grid's design. It highlighted the need for better coordination and fail-safes within the interconnected systems. In the wake of the blackout, there were significant changes in how power systems were managed across North America. The event led to the establishment of more rigorous standards for grid management including the formation of the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. This corporation was tasked with enhancing the reliability and security of the bulk power system in the U.S. and Canada. The Screaming Tunnel The Screaming Tunnel, nestled near Niagara Falls, Canada, is a potentially haunted site that has garnered significant attention for over two decades. This 125-foot-long tunnel was originally constructed in the early 1800s, primarily serving as a drainage passage for the Grand Trunk Railway. However, it also provided a safe crossing for farmers and their livestock beneath the bustling railway tracks. As with many historical sites, the Screaming Tunnel has accrued its share of eerie stories over the decades. The most prevalent legend tells of a young girl who tragically met her end within the tunnel under horrifying circumstances. Though the stories vary, they all paint a picture of terror and tragedy, contributing to the tunnel's haunted reputation. According to local lore, one story suggests that the girl was trying to escape a catastrophic blaze in a nearby farmhouse. Another grim version hints at a much more sinister act by a family member during a custody dispute. The tunnel is said to echo with her screams, which can supposedly be heard if one stands in the tunnel at midnight and lights a match only to have it extinguished by a mysterious wind. Skeptics have argued that the quote, screaming heard from the tunnel is more accurately explained as a wind tunnel effect than paranormal activity. Despite its ghostly fame, 
The Screaming Tunnel also draws attention for its architectural and historical significance. It has even caught the eye of the film industry. Notably, it was featured in David Cronenberg's adaptation of Stephen King's The Dead Zone. Make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell if you haven't done so already. As usual, I love you all and thank you all for your support. I really appreciate how many of you have come to enjoy my content. Shout out to my patrons Noah Schubert, Iced Mocha, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, Jeffer Metcalf, Z Volts, Director Delta, Unknown Delusions, Faye, Jack Russell, Boom Slang, and Blasphemous. Big shout out to YouTube members Jordan All and Low Life Baphomet. Until next time, stay safe and healthy. Peace out, everyone.